Welcome back to Generally Speaking. We have a very exciting guest today, the co-author of the book, The Politics Industry. It's Catherine Gale. She's a businesswoman, business strategist, and political entrepreneur. It, I don't know. I made that up. So, uh, But it's, it's so great to have you on, and uh, I think my audience is really going to enjoy what you have to say because it's a unique story, tale, and, and actually, I think, revolves around your life in terms of being a businesswoman. So how did you, how did you get involved in being a political entrepreneur or a political innovator? Yeah, you know, it, it, it really is interesting because now that I'm in politics, it still relates every day, all the time, back to what I learned in business which is, as, as you know from reading my book, but I'll say to the audience, the core idea of my work is to solve this conundrum and, and problem for a country, which essentially is, why are the customers of the politics industry so dissatisfied, you know, across parties, across ideological spectrum, so dissatisfied with what we're getting out of Washington, D.C., and yet, as customers of the politics industry, we really have no other choices other than two. You know, in this land where we could have 50 refrigerator choices, just like we have two choices, and we don't see new competition coming in even when we're dissatisfied. So that's certainly not the way it works in, you know, the business that I spent my career in and any business that your uh, viewers have been in, why is it that way? And how could we change it so that the success of people in politics was directly related to their success at delivering results that made lives better in this country? So, so your job as um, the head of your company, uh, the Gale Foods, right, is what the, uh, right. what the company was called. was called. And you made cheese. Maybe other things. I know you made cheese. Cheese, we did. So if if your customers come to you and say, "Well, I've got a problem with your cheese," then you, as the head of the company, well, you better figure out how to solve their problem because you're going to lose your business. And so when you look at the politics industry, you say, "These guys don't care. They have no incentive to care." Here's the thing. So when I needed to, so we could say, oh, it's so great that I cared, but let's just get down to like baseline incentives. As the business owner, I needed to care because if I didn't make my customers happy, they would go somewhere else and then there would go my business. So yes, I want to do the right thing by my customers, all that, but bottom line, that's how business is successful. You make your customers happy. And if you don't make them happy, someone else will. And so again, what we're getting at is in politics right now, the ins that incentive is absent from our system. So what we have in the industry of politics is a disconnect, which is to say, if you imagine that here's a circle, you know, acting in the public interest. So like Congress solving problems for us. And then here's another circle, the likelihood that people in Congress are gonna get reelected. These things aren't connected. So making my customers happy was connected with that my business did well and I kept my job and grew my business, et cetera. And this connection is missing in politics. And then not only can they keep getting reelected and keep doing well without any results, there's no opportunity for any new competitors to come in to threaten their position. And this sets up just a fundamentally unhealthy competition in politics. And, and the question is, you know, how can we change that? Because it, I should say one other thing. What's really interesting about this is that even as the customers are super unhappy, the industry itself is doing amazingly well. Doing so like, well. you sort of know this. They love it. Exact numbers. We can go to Washington D.C. We can go around. You can see the level of business that's there. We can know that there's some crazy. I don't know if this is the exact right number, but that half a billion dollars was spent in the Georgia Senate runoff. 
that money goes to all the people whose jobs are in this politics industry, the consultants, the pollsters, the, you know, the social media gurus, the advertisers, all this business of politics. And if their business keeps doing better and having more revenue, even as the customers are dissatisfied, then that doesn't make any sense. And we in, in, as customers, we don't usually think of ourselves that way. We just think of ourselves as voters and we think, oh, we have to pick the right person. But it turns out, and again, this is what I learned from business when we look to politics, that what we have to do is say, wait, how can we incent, how can we match up the people in the business, their incentives for, the, for their own careers and their businesses to do well with our need for results? It's, and it's so important. You know, when I started looking at back in 2014, you know, China's influence in our society, we started looking with the industrial base. And so manufacturing had, had completely gone from the United States. We lost over 70,000 factories, millions of manufacturing jobs when they entered the WTO. So from an ex economic perspective, America wasn't doing well and in, in, in certainly in, in manufacturing. And then you look in social today, we have division, we have censorship in social media, and really so technology is a problem. And then just in terms of what you're talking about on the business side, we have massive corporate you know, uh, monopolies that are going on all across. And so one of the things that I think about that many people are focused on is their internet service provider. Usually they only have one. So they pay a lot of money and they get bad service. And, and then we have, the other issue we have today is the Fed is printing money like nobody's business and it's all going into the stock market. You're not seeing any of it enter into um, productivity or our economy or you know, Main Street. It's all going into, really into Wall Street. And then so, so I've gone through all of these iterations because I'm trying to figure out you know, how do we heal ourselves as a country and because the Chinese are taking advantage, the Chinese Communist Party is taking advantage of all these problems we have. And then I ran across your book and, and I realized that there was a problem because I had been in D.C. as a policymaker through the Air Force, working in the White House, working in the Pentagon. I realized we had, we couldn't implement policy that actually was in the nation's interest. And so that's why I left government. And your book, The Politics Industry, really nailed it in terms of that's exactly the problem. So the same problem that somebody has with their internet service provider in rural America because they only have one provider and so they charge them a lot of money and they get poor service is exactly what you're talking about in the politics industry. And the reason that you, I, I think the reason you were able to kind of pick that out is because of your background. You didn't come from the politics industry. Because if you, I've talked to congressmen, senators, all kinds of people that are incentivized. In fact, I've been told directly by people that have been in office that if they don't toe the party line, they get primaried the very next year or the very next election cycle, and they are out. And so the, who you have to pay homage to, who your customer and, and who you're incentivized by, is in fact the party. They're the ones that... that that finance your campaign and the party wants you to do things that, you know, with this extreme polarization that we have, that really gain the party money. How does a party get money? By drawing a stark contrast between the other party. And what I realize, and, and this is from, from my own effort in, in policy in DC, is that the parties, at least when it comes to policy making in DC, they tend to, you know, favor themselves over the American people. So whether it's the right or the left, they're not doing things for the citizens, they're doing things for themselves. And so your book really kind of, I think, nails it in terms of what are some solutions that we can do. So in your mind, kind of how, can you explain some of those solutions to, because some people haven't read your book and haven't seen your uh, wonderful TED video. Oh, yes. Thanks for mentioning the TED Talk. I do hope uh, people spend all the time here and watch that. Um, here's, here's what, first of all, you're totally right about this. Thank you for uh, reading the book and resonating with it, which, which people really do because we all understand this disconnect. And here, so I'll say a couple things and then go into the solution. So first of all, 
to get at your point about no competition, we now call the politics industry the duopoly. So it's not a monopoly, you know, there's two, but they have completely protected themselves from other competitors. We think they're competing all the time, but in this duopoly, it turns out they actually work really well together in one particular way. And that is to rig the rules of the game of their industry behind the scenes to protect themselves jointly from new competition. So that's why you can give 313 times more money to Democrats or Republicans than you can to an independent candidate, for example. So they, they figure out ways to do that. In fact, um, sometimes when I speak, business people come up to me after and say, well, there should be an antitrust lawsuit against this you know, industry. And uh, you won't be surprised to know that ever so conveniently, antitrust legislation doesn't apply to the politics industry. So when we think about it, the people in the politics industry are the only, are, are sort of the only people who regulate themselves, right? They're in the industry and they make the rules of the game of the industry, whereas the rest of us are actually regulated by, you know, people in government regulating us, but they, they do that themselves. And that, that creates a big problem. Here's how I like your uh, viewers to think about it. We don't get results and there's no accountability for not getting results. The main reason, I'm gonna simplify this down because, because it's worth simplifying because if we all focused on these two reasonably simple things, it would make an enormous difference. The main reason we don't get results in politics, meaning, and when I say results, I mean legislation by Congress that solves our key problems. Doesn't mean everybody gets everything they want. It means we move forward instead of this crazy gridlock and these are the evil people or those are the evil people. Is because we have party primaries. So you said, oh, they're answering to the party, the, the politicians, but in truth they are, and they're answering, politicians are answering to a, a minority of the party. Voters who turn out in party primaries and that's about, let's say, 15% turnout overall. So let's say about 7.5% in the average Democratic primary and 7.5% in the average Republican primary. They tend to be more ideological than voters as a whole. And so they push candidates further to the right and further to the left than the general electorate would, in most cases, want. And that can change what people have to say to get elected. It may change who gets elected because the only election that matters is the primary. The general mostly doesn't matter. We know who won. The Republican won in a red district, the Democrat won in a blue district. You know that when you come out of the primary. The real problem with the primary is not who it elects. It's what their incentives are when they're in Washington, D.C. needing to solve our problems and they have an opportunity, let's say, to reach a bipartisan consensus on immigration reform or debt deficit reduction or a health care um, you know, plan. The questions that we would like them to ask while they're cons this legislator, while they're voting on this bill is, is this the right idea? Is this a good, is this the best thing? Is this what my constituents want? But the only thing that they can really focus on is, Will I win my next party primary if I vote for this? And in almost all the difficult issues, the answer is no, you won't win your Democrat primary if you vote for that compromise. And no, you won't win your Republican primary if you vote for that compromise, meaning they're almost forbidden to make a deal, almost forbidden to do something common sense where even the public might know, OK, that wasn't exactly what we wanted, but at least we haven't been fighting about the same immigration thing for two decades now, and every election we have the exact same issues. We were, we're not allowed to do that in our personal lives. We don't get to like live in the hope that someday we get everything exactly how we want. We have to make decisions, compromises, and move forward. And they can't do that because of the primary. And then the second piece is, so that's why we don't get results. And then the second piece is, and there's no accountability for not getting them because there's never any new competition. And that's because in our system right now, if someone new wants to come in, they're considered a spoiler. 
Do you know that uh, term, Rob? I mean, you're, I think you're a little bit of Absolutely. libertarian. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, you know, in some respects, President Trump was somewhat of a spoiler because you did see both kind of the, you have the Romneys of the world and, you know, so if you were a GOP person, you were like, I don't really like this guy. And if you were a Democrat, I really don't like this guy. It's almost like the two parties came together in their, in, and when I'm talking about the party establishments, came together in their loathing of him. It's almost, and I saw it. I saw it from a policy perspective. So think about it in terms of national security policy. I've worked, I'd worked under, I've seen the Bush administration, Clinton administration, Obama administration, and I've seen policy being made. And what I found when I got to D.C. is, okay, on national security, there's a consensus between the two sides. So when, and I saw this at the White House, when the president was offered a policy, and I could tell you exactly how a Bush appointee would answer or a Obama appointee would answer. And then he said, no, I'm not going to do that, something else. Both sides went absolutely crazy because they're like, he's not doing what we would do. And so even though that they, they, they pretend like there's this big difference, and there is ideological differences on both sides, they actually come together in D.C. and form a consensus, particularly around national security policy, and then they tend to operate the same way. And if anybody challenges that, this is like, should we go in all these incessant wars? Should we be spending all this money abroad? And there's a consensus. So if you're McCain, or if you're Schumer, if you're Pelosi, if you're McConnell, they all say that and agree on the same things. And, and so what I saw is, he was saying, no, we shouldn't do that. And so in a lot of ways, he was an outsider that was really an insider because he came up through the Republican Party. But what you're saying, a true outsider, in, 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 in really in the, in, the, in the real sense of the word, is it's impossible for them to come up in our system because we, the parties themselves have designed it so that they control the process. They, they control the rules of the game. Now, you guys did something, you know, in, in creating this book, and you've created momentum, and you, in your TED Talk, you talk about Alaska being the first state in 2020 to basically implement um, this, this, this voting system. So, I guess, is your thought that in 2022, we're going to begin to see the real outcomes of that, and so we could see in Alaska a true independent, uh, at least from in terms of the re representatives that are going D.C., uh, is it also state representative? Could you see really a, a whole new political uh, orientation for me in Alaska? So let, let's talk about that. Uh, could I go over quickly what, what it is that Alaska passed, I meaning what it yes, is yes, that please. I recommend? Okay, so, so again, since we don't get results because of party primaries, and we don't get accountability because no new competitors can get in. And that's because of plurality voting, which I won't get into in detail in the moment. Those are the two things we have to change. So what we propose in our book, and then I'll get to Alaska because this is what they just did, is something called final five voting. So it says, hey, all those rules about how we vote, they are uh, not in this pocket constitution. They're just made up. And they really... Oh, yeah, fantastic. Okay, you got the declaration in yours, too. Oh, wait, I got the declaration in mine. Okay, and um, they're just made up. They don't work. Clearly, they don't work. So they belong to us, and we can change them. And this is what we should change, too. It's something that we call final five voting. It's supposed to make us think of healthy competition, like the final four, you know, NCAA tournament. I like, I like that. Final final yeah, four. I don't know. If I say NCAA too much, maybe they're going to call me and say, we can't call final five voting that. But nonetheless. Okay, so final five voting. It's two things. First, let's just get rid of these broken party primaries. And instead, we'll have one unified primary, so just one ballot. All the candidates run on that, and you go in and vote, pick your favorite candidate, and then the top five finishers will go on to the general election. So now we're not just sending one Democrat and one Republican. We're going to send five really, ideally, really talented people, the top five finishers. In a, 
super, let's say, red district, maybe you're sending three different Republicans. Maybe there's a Trump Republican, a never Trump Republican, a libertarian sort of Republican. OK, meaning we got competition because we're not all the same. We don't fit into two buckets. That's for sure. OK, so now you have five go to the general election and between the primary and the general, you now have a diverse um, sort of dynamic competition of ideas. There could be someone who's really running on some of the issues you talked about, like raising some of these concerns about China. Right now, when we have the Democrats run on this, the Republicans run on this, we never even really learn anything in our elections anymore, right? Okay, so now we have five running, fabulous competition. And then in the general election, we're gonna do one other thing that's different. Now, when we as voters go to the polls, we get to say out of these five, I like them in this order. As in, you just fill in little circles, you know, here's this name, my first choice. I totally want this person to win. And then, yeah, that one would be pretty good you know, all the way down to my fifth choice, my last choice over my dead body. You know, do I want this person to be to be present? I fill in that little bubble. And everybody then, would say Trump today, right? No, half, half the people would. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so and then the polls close and uh, we count. I mean, the computer counts, you know, all the first place votes. And if one of those five has over 50 percent, Great, election's over, that person wins. So, so when, you, when say you say over 50%, fifty percent, over fifty percent of the first place, first place votes, votes right? right? Right. The first place votes. Because let me give a sideline for a moment. Now that we're gonna have such great competition, meaning we're finally gonna have these new competitors that say, Hey, current, you know, incumbents, you're not getting the job done, you know, choose me instead. Um, now that we're gonna have that, what we can't do is have five and then if they split the vote equally, let someone win with like 21% of the vote. That wouldn't be helpful, right? In, in, because in the book, you guys, was it Pennsylvania that you used as an example where the governor would win with 38% of the vote? I can't remember what state you were talking about, but you'd use this example for a state and, and, and basically year over year they would get, or each election cycle, they would get less than 50% of the vote but they got most votes, so they win. Right. I think it was probably Maine that you're talking about, although I can't remember the exact percentages. But again, I'll say something about plurality voting. So when we you know, created the country, there weren't examples of good ways to vote because there weren't other democracies. So our founders copied from countryside elections in Britain. And that was this idea of, OK, here's what we'll do. The person with the most votes wins. Wins. And now, yeah, most votes. Now that seems totally logical and fair and democratic, except it turns out it's this huge problem because what it means, like what you're just getting at, if you have three candidates, then someone can win with let's say 34%, you know, and each of the other two got 33. So the person who wins with 34% is only appealing to a third of the electorate and is only answering to a third of the electorate and doesn't sort of have the freedom or the incentive to solve problems for everybody. And it's because of this that we only ever see Democrats and Republicans, because whenever somebody new wants to come in, they're told, oh, no, 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 don't you dare run. You'll just spoil the election. And again, I think I read that you're a bit of a libertarian. So this spoiler problem, if we go back to the 2016 election, the presidential, and I don't focus on presidential, but I use this example. You may remember, you know, Gary Johnson was running as the libertarian, but voters on generally the right libertarians were told you might like him. But even though this is a democracy, don't you dare actually vote for the guy because all he's going to do is take votes away from Trump. Yeah, because he's not going to win because we're going to he's not going to win. You're going to have a Republican or a Democrat. So then you're just, just wasting your vote. Yeah, it's a spoiler. That made he was a spoiler. So we never get any new people running because the best they can do is spoil the election for the candidate they're most like. And that's the real way that that Democrats and Republicans keep being the only two, even when you know people are dissatisfied. So long back to our solution now. Now we have top five primaries. We go into the general. Now we finally have five and none of them should spoil the race for anybody else, and you shouldn't waste your vote by picking the one you like. 
So you rank them. We count the first choices. If someone has a true majority over 50%, they win. If they don't, we you have instant runoffs. Totally great competition, which is to say, okay, there's five, nobody won yet. Nobody's over the finish line yet. Drop the person who's in last place. And any voter who had selected that candidate who's now been kicked out of the race because they lost, now had that voter's vote transfers to their next choice who's still in the race. Got it. Got so it. so all the people yes, that like, we got rid of, yep. you know, for the because the fifth candidate goes away, the one that got the least amount of, uh, of number one votes, they go away. So on those ballots, those people ostensibly chose a number two candidate. Their votes transfer now to the number two candidate. So do those look like, uh, in, our, in our runoff, do those look like... The, that candidate just got a bunch more number one votes. Is that the way we, we, we should think about it? Eff effectively, yes. Because okay. let's think of it this way. This really helps people. It's just like runoffs, but instead of having to physically keep coming back, you cast all your votes at once. So how it would work if it was physical is you would show up in the general election and you would choose in the five. And then they would count the votes and they would say, oh, we don't have a winner yet. Nobody has over 50 percent. We're kicking out the last person. Come back next week and choose among these four. And then we go, oh, we don't have a winner yet. We're kicking out the person who came in fourth place. Come right. back next week and choose and the, among and the, the mechanism that you, that you use, use is the accumulation of first place votes. And those accumulation of first place votes come by transferring whoever they voted for in the next order up as you know their first place vote. So say we get rid of the first round, nobody wins, you get rid of number five, their number two goes to number one, say it's the number two candidate, now we still don't have, we get rid of the number four candidate, their number two goes to, and then we finally get you know, one that has now over 50%. So it's, as soon as you get over 50% of the number one votes, you win. And you never have to go back and do this because you've already made your choices at the first ballot. So we don't have to do the Georgia runoff. It, it happens on, on election day. We know who wins and we elect somebody that more than 50% of the people are happy with, which I think is a great... Yeah, at more than 50, it has these great outcomes. First of all, more than 50% of the people are happy, which means that, I mean, they're not maybe as happy as if they could have gotten their first choice, but now they had five people to choose from and they get, most of them will get one of their top choices. That's how it would get to over 50%. And, uh, and then now the key is, because again, it's not about our, our issue, our reforms are not about changing who gets elected. It's about changing what the winners are incented to do. Sometimes it might change who, but as long as it changes what they do, I'm agnostic, which is to say now, whoever is elected that way goes to Washington, D.C., and their boss is the, the general election voters. Their boss is not the party. Their boss is not party leadership. Their boss is not Nancy Pelosi. Their boss is not Mitch McConnell. Their boss is not Barack Obama. It's not Trump. It is their voters. Um, and it's their general election voters, not that small number of people who participate in the primaries. Now, the people who participate in the primaries still choose those first five, and then they vote again in the general. They're not disenfranchised in any way. But now every vote matters. And... And most importantly, when they're there now, these representatives uh, and senators, when they want to solve a problem, they now know that they won't automatically lose. Because they, because they went over across the aisle. So, well, I mean, say they're, they're Republican or Democrat or maybe Libertarian, but they won't lose because their party basically punishes them because they, they tried to solve a problem. Right. But that their party or their or the primary voters, you know, who could turn out and just say, oh, you did that compromise thing. You know, you're out. Yeah. So because, again, what do the American people care about? They are 
sort of crying out for, would you people please get something done? Yeah, they want jobs, they want health care, they need infrastructure. I mean, there's so many things that we used to do in this country that we got away from. And I really believe that, you know, you know, this politics reform is, I think, key. One of the key things to unlocking, you know, manufacturing and infrastructure and, and science and technology and STEM education, all things that we've you know, pretty much gotten out of the habit of. By the way, all that stuff has gone over to China. I don't know if you've noticed. But, so tell me about Alaska, what they actually did, um, what they actually did vote for, and how you think that's going to change things in Alaska. But then, you know, how do we move on from Alaska? How, and how do people get involved? How do they help? Perfect. Okay. So, because of this Constitution, all of the rules about elections are delegated to the states. So all the states, any state could say, oh, we like final five voting. We don't want this crummy party primary anymore. You know, we don't want plurality voting and spoilers. We're gonna change the rules. Alaska did it first. My hat goes off to a man named Scott Kendall. So back in 2017, Scott Kendall, uh, an Alaskan, a Republican from Alaska, uh, was concerned about where their state government was going, and also he had worked for their independent governor and for Senator Lisa Murkowski, and he had seen, you know, problems in uh, their in sort of federal representation in those elections as well. And he was saying, "What do we need to do to change this?" And I'm so gratified. He explains he read my 2017 Harvard Business School report where we laid out this case for changing the competition in elections and changing these rules of the game. And then he decided that was what Alaska needed. So this is like one person, Scott Kendall, remember that name. And then he founded, you know, an effort and he wrote the bill, meaning that he wrote a ballot measure. So in Alaska, like in half the states, they, the citizens can vote on things they wanna change. And so he wrote this ballot measure that includes uh, exactly what I propose except it's four candidates advancing instead of five, so I would call it final four voting. And then ran, and then you know got lots of people to support. Obviously, it wasn't Scott all the way to the finish. It's a huge team, um, including Shay Siegert, another great name, and uh, many people across all ideologies in Alaska, where independents are a majority, by the way. And then on November 3rd, Alaskans went to vote in the presidential, and the federal elections, et cetera. And then they had a choice. Do you vote, this isn't what the language said, I'm just paraphrasing. Do you vote yes or no for final five, final four voting? And Alaskans voted yes, it won. So what that means is now, and they did it for state and federal, although I, I very much recommend that most states just focus on changing the rules for Congress right now. But nonetheless, Alaska was successful in doing it for Congress and for yeah, the So you recommend that is because they're take, biting off more than they should at one time? Yeah, so the little segue to the, the little, uh, you know, sort of side note is that when we wanna change things, you know, change is hard. There is one thing, one thing that virtually everybody in the country agrees on right now, and that is that Washington is broken. The Congress is broken. People don't even agree that the presidency is broken. It depends on who is in the presidency. Then they, but Congress, Republicans, Democrats, and everybody's like, oh, that it's does broken. not work. So why don't we start doing something where we all agree, which is, okay, Congress doesn't work. Let's change these rules. Um, in Wisconsin, where we also have an effort, that's where I'm from, we have our you know, larger, well, our, our largest fundraiser for Trump, along with one of our largest uh, liberal philanthropists, joined together as members of our, you know, um, advisory group, basically pushing these changes. And they stand up and say, we don't agree on much, maybe not. That's, anything. that's <laughs> really amazing. So you got both of those to basically yeah. join you in Wisconsin with that. Wow, that's, that's quite an achievement. Our, our group in Wisconsin is totally bipartisan and back to Alaska, it's bipartisan. That's how it passed. And those were the people that supported it because this, this is a political innovation. It's not a reform. It's not a Trojan horse. 
right. for, you know, like we're sneaking it in for the Democrats to somehow benefit or for the Republicans to somehow benefit. This is an innovation that benefits all of us, the capacity of Congress to solve problems. And it's not job reduction. I mean, we're still going to elect the same number of Congress people, you know, and they can be Democrats and they can be Republicans, et cetera. But now the only way they're going to keep their jobs is by doing their jobs well. And if they don't do their jobs well, they're going to have new competitors. It's like such a perfect, you know, change. But so long story short, so Alaska votes for this. And now beginning in 2022, that's how the Alaska elections will work. That's so, so exciting. So what we see is, um, we'll see like Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. She now knows that she is, is she's her, I wouldn't say she's her own boss. She, the bo her boss is her general She's boss. already kind of independent though. So I think she, she's probably gonna be do okay. I would imagine you know, Alaska it seems like a, an interesting place from a political standpoint. You get all kinds of interesting characters from Alaska. She's going to do great. But what I want to bring up for the viewers is Lisa Merk, Senator Murkowski and her colleague, whose name I can't remember, um, all of a sudden, sorry, are the only two people in the Senate right now who don't have to, they're not the prisoners of, of the, the party. party primary. Yeah. They are not, you know, it's okay. So I have a three year old, so I'll just use this vernacular. You are not the boss of me. Okay. So, you know, someone. <laughs> Typical three year old. <laughs> yeah. Like Senator Murkowski essentially has this, you know, you are not the boss of me to a Mitch McConnell or to a Trump or to, um, you know, whoever is going to be the next Republican that winning the nomination. Her voters and right. her own views and vision and plan are the boss of, you know, her decisions, which means she has agency and freedom to do what needs doing. And I'll, and I'll say something quickly here. I want to make it super clear. I don't have any problem. I, I mean, I sound like I'm criticizing the parties and, and Democrats and Republicans. I love political parties. I love that people are engaged. I love that people want to run. I love that people care deeply about policies. I can't wait till I can join a party again, you know? But here's the thing. So no problem with Democrats, no problem with Republicans per se, you know, and no problem with parties. I don't even have a problem, Rob, that we have only two major parties. The problem I have and that we all have is that the current two are guaranteed to remain the only two, regardless of what they do or don't get done on our behalf. And meanwhile, we keep, you know, it seems like we're moving backwards. And, and, and so I think this is great. So, so Alaska is going to vote differently in 2022. How's the rest of the country going? You mentioned Wisconsin. What, so how's this ground game and how do people get involved? Okay, fantastic. So I've been working, you know, full time on this. I sold my company so I could really do this political innovation work. I decided it was more important than my cheese, even though I love my Thank company. Thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and... I've been working on it since 2017, and finally I realized, okay, I have to have an organization that really helps right. put money where mouth is, turn into action. So my organization is called, you know, the Institute for Political Innovation. Your viewers can go to it at political-innovation.org. But uh, the point of that organization is to, A, make this case to people so we can all say, oh, yeah, right. we, that sounds good. You define and then the, the second problem. thing is to set up the campaigns. I mean, you, I shouldn't even say to set up the campaigns. It is to help. Help somebody know. like this, this gentleman in Alaska do what he did in their, in state. their, in their state. state. Right. That's so that's brilliant. Because, because these changes belong to each state, belong to the people of the state. So we're a resource. So if someone's listening to this and they say, oh, we want to do that in New Jersey or we want to do that in Nebraska, then they can get in touch with us through political-innovation.org and we help incubate, you know, these campaigns. And so we have now. And so when people get in touch with us, Let's say there already is a campaign nascent. Most of them are nascent in the states. We can put people in touch with that, you know, uh, campaign in their state or help them start one. And we are working with, you know, people from around 10 states in a very serious way right now. 
There'll be multiple ballot measures like Alaska in 2022. Which states they'll be in, that's not final yet, but people are looking at it and there'll be campaigns founded and they'll vote. And then there'll be multiple states like where I'm from in Wisconsin, where we're working with our legislature and our governor to pass a bill. And so you're gonna see these changes made. And the really cool thing is, we don't have to change all 50 states to start seeing a difference in Washington, D.C., because once you have you know, 10 senators elected with different incentives and more freedom and agency on the part of uh, you know, 50 people in Congress, there's still gonna be Democrats and Republicans, but they're gonna have a lot of agency to collaborate and to be innovative and to answer to their general election voters. And, and I think it's you know, really quite, uh, it's so exciting. I mean, people are totally into this. And look, don't we all want something right now that isn't about doubling down on this side or this side? Like, since we think that's our only choice, there's def it's definitely true we make a choice. We're right. more and it's than the end, end of the, the world, world if your candidate doesn't win. So I got to ask you, innovators usually create a lot of animosity. So have you has have either the parties started to come after you? Because I would imagine as you begin to make gains, I mean, Alaska is like, eh, Alaska, not a big deal. But if you pull off 10 more states in 2022, there's going to be like a, a list of your name on the, you know, in the, in the, in the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and you'll be like enemy number one. Particularly all these consultants that make all of this money creating all of this. So has that started to happen yet, or are you still kind of enjoying the newness of it all? Because you, you're going to be the Steve Jobs of politics. That's what's going to happen. Okay, in my dreams, although I got black turtleneck on, so you're not doing my <laughs> You're dressed in the part. part. Okay, so um, no, not yet. And in my dreams, this movement has success such that, you know, people start to say, that's bad. You know, and I'm not, it, it happens a little, but not to that degree yet. But here's the thing that's really interesting about this. This is not the get rid of the politics industry, you know, uh, plan. This is make sure that the way the politics industry does well is by making their voter customers happy. They're going to get to make campaign commercials. They're going to get to run social media, et cetera. But the way and, and, and again, as I said, you can have the same number of jobs in Congress and someone's going to win it. And a lot of cases, it'll be the same people who win now. They'll just have more freedom. It's a way better job. Like Republican Congressman. Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin is, uh, you know, has said recently he really supports this bill in Wisconsin. And he said that selfishly, this would make his job. It would free, it would free him from his bonds. Yes. And then if he had colleagues who were also freed from those bonds, meaning, you know, you sort of freed up to use your talent and your passion, your patriotism. To solve people's problems. problems. I'm going to solve it. Yeah. I'm going to sound a little, um, you know, sort of... Uh, I don't know, maybe even overly optimistic. This is like win, 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 win. You know who loses? Party leadership. Right. Self-interested money in politics. Yep. Because now voters will be more important than money. Um, but then they also all, everybody will live in a better so, country. So everybody, everybody complains about Citizens United. They also complain about gerrymandering. It seems to me, basically what you're proposing basically defeats both of those. Really, because, because it, it really just, it, it, it short circuits Citizens United and gerrymandering, and it really puts the power back in the hands of the people. You know, I just want to talk about incentives, because what I realized, you know, as I started working on China in, in when I was at the Pentagon in 2014, you know, as I was talking to business owners about why they were doing the things that they were doing, which were counter to American interests, they were doing it because they were incentivized to do so. And so what the Communist Party has and China has done is tied incentives for the business owner to their interests. And so what you're saying in a, in a political sense, let's tie the incentives in the industry to our citizens' interests. And so... In, in, in a way, that becomes a way that you that you get the right kind of outcomes that you want. I mean, I think it's such a it's such a cool um, thing that you've done. I mean, it's 
so okay, I gotta ask, how long did it take you to figure this out to uncrack this nut? It took me three years to figure out what was going on in China. How long did it take you to figure this out? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, it took. There was like the buildup of my engagement in politics, you know, so all the learnings that I had, all the things I tried to do that didn't right. make any difference, like, you know, help candidates or care about policy. Or So this is while you're running your company. You're like, you're, you're donating to political parties and you're trying to get your candidates elected, yeah. which I see all the time. And then you're like, this is not working. Yeah, and then I'm doing policy, and then I was doing like, oh, let's all come together bipartisanship, and then none of that was working. And uh, finally, I and credit to a former Republican Congressman Mickey Edwards, you know, who had me see, oh no, it's the system. And I'm totally a systems thinker, and it was invisible to me. And so he it's says like, it's a system. Boom. So I'm like, bam, and then and then. This connection to competition, which is, I would say, one of the most unique things that my work brings to this, which is to say they're competing on the wrong things and they're winning on the wrong things. Uh, that came when I was doing my company strategy, and it was absolutely a light bulb moment. I mean, I would say so. So th actually, this is really neat because so you're working on your company strategy, and this happens to me too. Like. I'll get an idea when I'm looking at something else and it applies over there. So you're you're kind of a pattern person. So yeah. you so you took a pattern that you were seeing with your company, you're like, boom, this is it. Yeah, yeah. I took a framework, uh, it's called the Five Forces Framework because um, the person who later became my co-author from Harvard Business School had invented this framework, Five Forces, that we use to understand competition in our businesses. It's really classic business school stuff. And so when I was figuring out, look, like, how do I sell more cheese and who are my customers and who are my suppliers and, you know, what are my channels? This other side of my head was was going, oh, oh, we're not the most important customer. Oh, wait, there's high barriers to entry. There's no new competition. Like it was just bam, 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 bam. I would say it probably happened in one day. Now, was there, perf you know, sort of maybe it's not even perfect now, but my point is, De further development of the ideas exactly. But this light bulb of competition and this way of looking at it, which which enabled us, I didn't want to just look at it and say, oh, now it's so interesting that we understand why it's screwed up. I only wanted to look at it so once we understood, we could figure out what we should do. And um, so the, what we should do as in go to final five voting, that took longer. And, and so that is that when you kind of got um, you know introduced or how did you how did you run into Michael Porter because so you have this light bulb moment you're doing company strategy so how do you go from there to you Michael Porter and then you write the report in 2017 because Michael Porter was doing my company strategy with ah, me perfect okay there you so, go and then I you know have this whole other so you're thing. like hey we should do this for the politics industry. Yeah, so I said, I actually, I basically sold him on being my co-author, and I said, you don't have to do anything. You know, I got it all figured out. It's all done. But I wanted him to join me, really, because he added this enormous legitimacy, yeah. which is to say, if the creator of the five... Like, he understands competition, so he... If he buys into... And, and I will tell you that even in the in the dialogue, he wasn't like really on board at the beginning, but even in the dialogue as I convinced him, my success in teaching and convincing him only reinforced to me like sort of how valuable it was, you know? Right, because and if you can talk somebody, if you can explain, that's, that's the ultimate reinforcing behavior because now you realize, that, okay, I understand it enough that I can... I can explain it in a way that somebody can logically pick it up and take it. Yeah, and then he, you know, bought in and eventually became quite passionate, you know, about the work as well. And so, uh, you know, fast forward to today, uh, again, just hats off to Alaska that they have now made it clear that Final Five voting is achievable. And we know uh, from theory that it's powerful and now we begin to see people taking advantage of it in Alaska. So it even begins to get proven on this, you know, small uh, scale. And we've got the campaigns around the country. So I, I hope that your viewers will, I mean, there's a couple, by the way, 
people don't totally have to go start a campaign or donate huge dollars. They can also just really spread the word. Right. Because right. most of us think that to make things better, either we have to get some mythical perfect change candidates president, which that's not where that's not going to end up doing it, or that our side has to win everything and like slam its priorities right. down the other and side. And crush everybody else. Yes. Or that the reforms we have to make are ones that require constitutional amendments, like people want to get, you know, a deal right. with Citizens United or they get want rid to of the electoral college. college. They want to do all these things and you're not going to get constitutional amendments, so, which is even takes away the necessity to figure out if we should have them, you know, which I have different views on. Um, so this is what we've got is final five voting, which is powerful and it's achievable and it's nonpartisan because almost all those other choices, the things we would say, let's do that. They're very partisan. And what's scary because, you know, I, again, I look at China, I see an authoritarian regime and I see a lot of the same types of things being introduced into our system primarily because of the reasons you're saying. You know, one party wins and they just want to impose their view on everybody else. And that's not, that's not what we're about. We're about, you know, individual liberty, rule of law, private property, all of these things that really make our system unique. And we've gotten away from, and I think it's primarily because of the things that you bring up in your book. So, I mean, it's hats off to you. And, you know, I really want to thank you for being an American, a true American patriot. And, you know, I've been in national security for almost my entire life. And I didn't realize how important, you know, the security of our political system, particularly how it relates to, you know, how we preserve this, this constitutional republic. And I think you're doing so much, you're doing more, quite frankly, than the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, and, and, um, and the uh, Air Force that then, then, then they're doing to protect our country. And, and that's because our system is not under attack from invaders from outside our shores. It's really us. We're, we're tearing the house down, and it's because we've, we've allowed the system to kind of, it's kind of grown up. It just happened. It kind of came into being. And thank, thank God you recognized it. You wrote a book, and now you're actually doing something about it. So I really want to, I really want to congratulate you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, from from you know all Americans, and I want to thank you also for for coming on. Um, generally speaking, because uh, this has been probably one of the most exciting uh, discussions I've had. So thank you so much, oh, Rob. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's so energizing to me to talk about this stuff and the work is hard. So what I say to you is, you know, again, thanks for the compliments and this democracy belongs to all of us. I do love the idea and thank you for loving it. It only happens if the viewers, enough of them, doesn't have to be everyone, but enough of your viewers then say, I'm going to watch that TED talk and send it to a friend. I'm going to share this, you know, Rob's generally speaking, uh, you know, YouTube link here. Get the word out. It doesn't have to be like this. And it doesn't have to keep getting worse before it gets better. We can make a difference. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll put the, the, we'll put the, the link, link to the, to the TED, TED Talk, talk um, with, with this, this video, video and also the link for your book because I think people should read it if they want to learn more. And then um, they should go to the website. So we'll put the link to the website so they can get involved. And, you know, I want to help in any way I can too. So, you know, consider me. Uh, your your new soldier in your um, in your political innovation movement. Yes, general. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Generally Speaking. Make sure to leave comments below. Hit that bell to be notified of our next episode, and make sure to subscribe and like this channel. Thank you so much for viewing.